Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, and thank you to the organisers for asking me to speak. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist, and I'm here to show you that gastroenterologists are not just interested in endoscopy, although, of course, I am interested in endoscopy, and I make a lot of effort to be good at it. But we have a lot of other interests, like um, science and history and cultural attitudes, as well as clinical medicine. Um, and the subject I'm, not, I'm going to talk about is not just for men, although it does affect men both directly and indirectly, um, and it's never fatal. But nonetheless, it's of enormous consequence to um, our patients. And it seems to me from seeing patients that a lot of people don't understand. So the subject of my talk, this is your University Challenge Starter for 10. Sorry, this is your university challenge starter for 10. Um, and the question is, what is it that links Jerusalem artichokes, soya beans, cows, and electricity generation in Dakota? And of course, the answer is wind. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about a much misunderstood and maligned subject. Um, now, who in the audience can diagnose this patient? Achalasia, absolutely right. No gastric air bubble. And I put this in to illustrate the first bit of the talk, which is the first two or three slides, is about burping. And of course, people with achalasia don't burp a lot because they don't make any gas in their intestine that comes into the stomach and can be burped. They can swallow gas in the esophagus and burp, but interst upper intestinal synthesis of gas does not exist in a meaningful way. Carbon dioxide is generated in the upper gut, but because it's so soluble, it gets absorbed and breathed out in the breath. That's why people with achalasia don't have a gastric air bubble. They can't get it in from the top, and they don't make it inside. So burping, there's a guy in, um, in America called Michael Levitt who ought to be called the patron saint of intestinal gas. Um, and I tried to get a photograph for you, suitably embellished, but um, I couldn't find one anywhere on the internet, though he's, he's extremely well known. He was always first on the American Gastroenterology Association plenary sessions. I can't imagine why that was. Um, but burping, of course, is always due to swallowed air. And it's very, in my experience, a lot of patients don't understand that, and they don't understand it because their doctors don't understand it. If you stop swallowing air, then you won't burp. Now, sometimes it's a response to other symptoms, like reflux or emotional stress. And in some people, um, one of the disadvantages of a standard fundoplication is that people carry on swallowing air, but can't get it out because of the fundoplication, so they get the gas bloat syndrome. And the next slide illustrates, or is supposed to illustrate, how you stop people bloating, uh, burping. Um, I quite often see people who come in and burp continuously, and, and many of you will have seen the same thing. And you can always stop them immediately by stopping them swallowing. Now, the photograph that didn't come out, because I made this on a Mac, not a PC, um, is a slightly mad picture of me demonstrating the method, which involves holding a pencil between the teeth, right here. And you look completely bonkers, and it's not something that a burper can do at the dinner table. But it will stop them burping immediately, because it's very difficult to swallow with your mouth open. It's not completely impossible, but it's very difficult. So it might be some use to somebody. <laughs> um, now, of course, cultural attitudes, and here's where the, uh, the um, breadth of interest comes in. Um, cultural attitudes to rectal gas are enormously variable, and this president of Malawi tried to um, enact a law which forbade what he called, um, touchingly, the breaking of wind. Um, and that, of course, is a fertile ground for newspapers of a certain kind to make nice headlines, like the man behind this clampdown. Oh. Um, but of course, at other times, and in other places, 
uh, the passage of rectal gas has been celebrated. And you will all know that there was this gentleman um, called Pujol who uh, ran a show at the Moulin Rouge in Paris in which he um, performed various rectal feats. Um, and I, I looked him up on Wikipedia and it said, amongst other things, Pujol could suck water into his rectum and shoot it out back several yards in the distance, a sort of human fire extinguisher. Um, he could blow out a candle from several feet away and imitate musical instruments and play songs through a rubber tube inserted into his rectum. <laughs> now, this was not something which was frowned upon. People came from all over the world to watch Pujol. <laughs> Um, he was the star attraction at the Moulin Rouge and performed for Edward R, Prince of Wales, um, King Leopold II and Sigmund Freud. He's said to have earned more than Sarah Bernhardt and when he passed his last in 1945, the Sorbonne offered his family a huge sum of money to examine the corpse's unique anatomy. <laughs> the family declined with the comment, there are some things in this life which simply must be treated with reverence. <laughs> um, so we could ask the question, what is in uh, Flatus? And normally speaking, 99% um, of it is ordinary gases that you will have heard of and, of course, have no smell. <laughs> and then there are trace gases, which are less than 1%, which are responsible for the odour, if there is one. And then you could ask the question, how much gas is normal? Um, and I think this slide's quite telling in the relationship between men and women, um, whether it's the woman who's counting. In fact, this is a problem for both men and women. And this is a study, not often repeated, of collecting rectal gas by um, inserting a rubber tube into the rectum. And these people were so dedicated that they sat in a bath of water to demonstrate that there was no leakage. Um, so the women are on the left and the men are on the right, and the volumes of gas are recorded on the vertical axis. And this is, of course, the science of flatology. Um, and you see that the biggest gas producer was, in fact, a woman. Um, and the gases produced are carbon dioxide, hydrogen, methane, and nitrogen and, on, and oxygen. And of course, the biggest contributor is hydrogen in nearly all cases. The flatus frequency, um, we'll call it gently, um, is between 10 and 20 times a day in men and women. And the average volume of rectal flatus passed is about 90 mils, a bit more for men, a bit less for women. So where does this all come from? Well, we talked about burps, and um, oxygen and nitrogen are swallowed and brought back up. Everything that comes out of the rectum, for practical purposes, is generated by bacterial fermentation in the colon of unabsorbed foodstuffs. And this illustrates the effect of diet. Um, on the vertical axis, the volume of gas produced and in the left-hand panel shows the normal amounts of gas on a normal diet and then on an elemental diet. And you'll see that the amount of gas produced drops precipitously, particularly hydrogen, when you go onto an elemental diet. And this gives you some little idea of what it is that we malabsorb enough for the intestinal bacteria to have breakfast. Um, comparing the amount of gas produced by 15 mils of lactulose solution, which is in the yellow bar, 100 grams of wheat produces the same amount of hydrogen exhaled in the breath, and in parallel, um, passed per rectum. Beans, by contrast, produce twice as much as uh, 15 mils of lactulose, and rice flour produces a tiny amount because it's virtually all completely absorbed in the small bowel. And essentially, the, the hydrogen comes, by around, comes about by, malab 
by digestion of malabsorbed carbohydrates. Um, complex carbohydrates, wheat, corn and potatoes, resistant and what's called retrograded starch, where the starch has been frozen and thawed, is difficult to digest. Lactose, of course, is very common, very common as a cause of rectal wind. Um, you have to remember that a large proportion of the people in the world are lactose intolerant. Most of them know about it, but some don't. Then there are all the products used in dietetic sweets and chewing gum and sugar-free drinks, mannitol, sorbitol and xylitol. None of us can absorb those. We used to use mannitol as a bowel preparation for colonoscopy. If you give enough of it, it will give you profuse diarrhea because it's not absorbed and acts as an osmotically active molecule in the, in the intestine. And you can use lactulose the same way. If somebody wants a complete clear out, an entire bottle of lactulose works brilliantly. Very good preparation for colonoscopy. The only thing you have to be aware about is that they generate a lot of hydrogen. So you mustn't make any sparks or light any cigarettes in there. <laughs> anyway, I won't go through all those, but um, part of the product of this has been what's now called the low FODMAP diet. And some of you may have heard of it. Um, FODMAPs are fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, and polyols, but basically poorly absorbed sugars which come through into the colon. And a low FODMAP diet is very good for symptoms of irritable bowel and very good for bloating and distension. Essentially, it restricts poorly absorbed carbohydrates, which are found distributed in our food where you wouldn't suspect them. Um, the components of them all have the same functional properties. They're poorly absorbed, they're small and osmotically active, and they're rapidly fermented. And the diet reduces gas production and relieves IBS symptoms and bloating. So very useful. About 70% of people, much better than any other treatment for irritable bowel. So the other problem is, where does the smell come from? And the smell comes from um, reduction of sulfate, sulfur in the diet, which comes about as preservatives which are used in a lot of modern supermarket foods um, and from amino acids in mostly in protein, methionine, cysteine, cysteine and taurine. But there's endogenous production by the digestion of mucins, so you will always get some hydrogen sulfide and other things produced. The other things in the bottom of that list are relatively um, minor components of um, the smell of flavour. Interestingly, hydrogen sulphide doesn't come out in the breath. We make quite a lot of it, but nobody goes around, or at least as far as I know, nobody's been described with a genetic defect where they go around smelling of hydrogen sulphide. And that's because there is a complex um, enzyme system in the colon wall which is extremely effective at uh, neutralizing uh, hydrogen sulfide and converting it into thiosulfate. Garlic, on the other hand, contains a sulfide called allyl methyl sulfide, which is not acted on by this um, enzyme so that it does come out in the breath. So what can you do about excess gas? Well, all sorts of things have been used and many of them don't work. Um, cymethicone, which you get in Infocol, doesn't work. Activated charcoal works if it's dry, but not if it's wet. So if you eat it, you're wasting your time and money. Antibiotics, arguable, but not, not tenable on a long-term basis. And what in the States are called toot trappers, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, Clearly, if somebody's having acarvose or lactulose or lactose, then you need to recognize that and stopping them will reduce the amount of gas produced. There's a compound um, marketed in the States called Beano, which you take when you eat beans, and it contains alpha-galactosidase, which helps with the digestion of beans. And that does work, and it's available in this country, but under another uh, under a group of other names. And if you're really desperate, you can take bismuth. But you have to take it all the time. 
and it's not a very pleasant drug to take. This is the effect of activated charcoal on flatus production, just to show that if you eat it, it makes absolutely no difference, either to the amount of hydrogen produced or the number of flatus episodes per hour. These are toot trappers, and um, a, a huge variety of, the, of these are available in the States, and they're basically um, cushions you wear inside your underwear, and you have to have special underwear, which is gas impermeant, made of mylar. Um, <laughs> And in case any of you are thinking that this is just an American obsession, oh, there is, um, I can't show you this picture either, there is a, um, a British product. Um, you look them up on the internet, they're called Shreddies. Now, I've never fancied going around with a packet of breakfast cereal in my underpants. <laughs> the noise when you sit down, you know. Um, but you can buy them over the internet and they're, they're called um, Flatus Protective Underwear. Uh, whether that'll be any use to your patients. Um, now, there are a few things you need to be aware of. The vast majority of people who complain of, um, of excess gas have nothing wrong with them. They're normal people, perhaps eating the wrong things. But there are a few, um, if you have interest, and most of them are terribly obvious. You're not going to see a fit person sitting in front of you complaining of passing of gas who's got any of these disorders. But malabsorption, um, perhaps the one exception, is hypolactasia. Now, the last little thing I was going to talk about was abdominal distension. And this actually sort of doesn't fit in this uh, talk because it's not due to gas. And that may come as a surprise to most of the audience because from the referrals I see, most of my colleagues think it is due to gas. This is a picture taken from a paper published in 1949, so this isn't a new problem. And it's even less a new problem because the patient was seen in 1911. It was reported by a guy called Walter Alvarez, who was a physician in, in the States. The top picture is a bloated lady. And the bottom picture is the bloated lady 25 seconds later after breathing a few lungfuls of chloroform. So clearly it cannot be gas. This is another one of Walter Alvarez's patients, starting at the top unbloated, and you can see her right hand out of the picture. It's also out of the picture in the other pictures too, but it's hanging down, and it's hanging in a bucket of ice water. And the stress associated with a freezing hand has made her bloat. So he called this a hysterical type of non-gaseous abdominal bloating um, and said the bloating isn't due to excess of gas. And quite clearly, we see two, I see predominantly, two groups of people who bloat. One who can eat a quarter of a round of sandwich and suddenly look nine months pregnant. And another group, probably more common, who start off in the morning unbloated and become more and more bloated during the day till the evening their skirts and trousers don't fit. Walter Alvarez was right, um, and I tried to do this study 25 years ago, but I, we didn't have the technology then. But this is a recently published CT scan study of people who have abdominal <laughs> distension. They're Spanish, none the worse for that, um, and they were encouraged to come in for a low-dose CT scan when not bloated and then when bloated. And if you compare the left side scan with the right side scan, the difference is that in the right side of scan when they're bloated, the diaphragm comes down. And there's nowhere else for the guts to go but out the front. And that is the mechanism of the common cause of abdominal bloating. And they measured the amount of gas by this clever CT software and showed that it only changed by 22 mils, hardly enough to account for the distension. Now, those are the vast majority of people that all of us are going to see. There is another group, which is rare, who have pseudo-obstruction, where there's a completely different situation. They have more gas in the bowel when they start, and when they eat, they get hugely more gas. But in this situation, the diaphragm goes up, 
not down. That's not, you're not going to see many of those. These are people who present with what are like irritable bowel syndromes, often with a lot of pain. And getting to the point of diagnosing pseudo-obstruction is quite difficult. Nonetheless, worth just knowing about the mechanisms. And that's illustrated briefly here. The left, the functional irritable bowel type bloating, and the right, the organic pseudo-obstruction type bloating. So um, I hope I've managed to convince you that endoscopists are no, not only interested in, um, sorry, gastroenterologists are not only interested in um, endoscopy, and that there is some scientific and historical basis behind some of the things we do. Thank you. Thank you.